Thinking aloud. Conversations on the leading edge of knowledge and discovery with psychologist Jeffrey Mishlove. Hello and welcome. I'm Jeffrey Mishlove. Today we're going to be exploring the heights and the depths of consciousness. With me is one of the most prolific writers in the English language, Colin Wilson, author of over 70 books, including 17 novels and numerous works in criminology, existential philosophy, psychology, religion, the occult, mysticism, wine, and music. Amongst his most well-known books are The Criminal History of Mankind, The Mind Parasites, The Philosopher's Stone, Religion and the Rebel, The Occult, Mysteries, and of course his first book which became a worldwide bestseller in 1956 when he was 24 years of age, The Outsider. Welcome, Colin. You know, you've described yourself as, to my surprise, as an individual, although you've written widely in so many areas and, and have written so much, it's, you've described yourself as a person who has basically written on one theme mm. your entire life. Yep, I've written the same book 70, 70 times over. And, and that is reconciling this issue of, of the heights of consciousness with the depths of despair. I know, you know, Isaiah Berlin, once said that there are two kinds of writers, hedgehogs and foxes. He said, um, the fox knows many things, the hedgehog knows just one thing. So Shakespeare is a typical fox. Tolstoy and Dostoevsky are typical hedgehogs. Now, I'm a typical hedgehog. I know just one thing, and I've repeated it over and over again. I've tried to approach it from different angles to make it look different, but it's the same thing. Much of your writing has focused on your own working through of, of states of panic, states of despair that, that you've experienced in your own life. Yes, I suppose that first book, The Outsider, was almost an autobiography. And, um, of course, uh, um, 25 years later, when I produced this book, Mysteries, I suddenly had this horrifying series of panic attacks that made me feel I was going insane. It was due to overwork, you know, I'd um, been working very, very hard on a series of books about crime. It was a part work, in fact, and I was supposed to write the introduction to each issue. And so, you know, it was pretty hard work. I had to, um, let's say the issue was on kidnapping. We would have a big kidnapping case, um, a big kidnapping trial, and my business was to do the history of kidnapping from the beginning. And, uh, you know, so I had to read up a lot of stuff to do this. And what happened was that the publisher suddenly said, OK, the American publisher says we can go. And uh, so, you know, off we went. And he said, look, I'm afraid we're going to need four articles per week. Now, this was OK, you know, there were 3,000 words each. Uh, you know, it was about 12 pages. And then later he said, I'm awfully sorry, we're going to need uh, seven articles per week. And then when I was really working like a madman, he said, look, I don't know whether you can manage this, but we need 10 articles per week. Now, this is a full-length book every three weeks. And so I was doing pretty well. I was working away nicely. And uh, one day, two bloody Canadian journalists came to interview me, and they were bores. Well, you know, they talked and talked and talked and talked. And I was doing pretty well until then, but you know the way you get when someone just talks to me. You go, Ugh. And, and I did this. And I went to bed the second night when they'd been here. And uh, about 4 o'clock in the morning, I woke up feeling a bit hungover and began to think about all the work I'd got to do. And quite suddenly, my heart began to pound and my face went all hot. And I thought, perhaps I'd better go straight downstairs and get to work immediately. Then I thought, no, 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 you're going really insane if you do that. And I made a great mistake. I tried to repress it by sheer willpower. And this was a mistake, you know because I could have done it if I'd gone all the way through with it, but it's like pulling back a spring and being terrified suddenly that it'll bound back on you. I let go, and quite suddenly, you know, my heart began to pound so fast I thought I was having a, a heart attack. So I rushed into the lavatory and I just sat there in the cool trying to sort of calm myself down as you might try to calm a frightened horse. And then I went back to bed after half an hour and it just started again as soon as I got into bed. So I went to the sitting room and put the lights on and I thought, 
you know, what's happening? I'd, I'd once written a book called The Mind Parasites, which was about this idea that parasites can insert themselves into your unconscious mind and just suck your energies dry. And that was just supposed to be a parable of what's wrong with human beings, you know, what you might call original sin. But now I was suddenly experiencing the damn thing. And um, finally, after hours, I went back to bed and I managed to stop the panic by just staring at the window frame and refusing to let my mind move an inch in either direction. And finally, I fell asleep, but I woke up the next morning feeling a total physical wreck, drained of energy. Now, I managed to get rid of this by actually describing it. I just went downstairs and I wrote it down, and this is the opening of my book, Mysteries. I just put it straight down on paper. And uh, when I finished that, I felt much better. But that night, before I went to bed, I thought, oh God, I hope it doesn't happen again. And of course, there's no more sure way of making sure it does happen again. I woke up in the middle of the night, thought about it, you know, boom, 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 and off it all went again. And you get this sort of funny sound in your ears, like as if you're swimming underwater, and so on. Anyway, I finally discovered after three or four nights of this that I could control it if I woke myself up as fully as I possibly could and then it was like a schoolmistress coming into a room full of quarrelling schoolboys and <coughs> like that and suddenly deathly silence and I found that I discovered the basic trick that it, it was as if there was a kind of higher Colin Wilson up there and when he chose to come down and make his presence known, everything was okay. But you know the way you are in the middle of the night, you wake up and you begin to worry about money and all kinds of things. The lower levels take over in the middle of the night. Well, this is what happened. Now, that experience seemed to me so completely pointless and miserable and rotten that I could see no meaning in what it seemed to undermine all my life's work. And yet, when at the end of three months I'd sort of struggled with this, what it amounted to was catching my adrenaline before it flooded into my bloodstream. As soon as I became afraid, you know, you feel that surge of adrenaline and everything goes hot. It was like, kind of, like catching a fly in the air before the adrenaline gets into your bloodstream and stopping it dead. And I learned this trick after a while, catching the adrenaline. And when finally I overcame the panic attacks, I realized that my wife could drop a plate on the floor and I didn't even flinch. I could stop the adrenaline like that. And the interesting thing was, I only realized afterwards that this was the most valuable experience of my whole life. That it had mm -hmm. taught me the real problems that I'd been writing about in The Outsider. Mm -hmm. Well, much of the history of mystical, shamanistic, psychic training has to do with curing oneself of, of in forms of what we might think of as insanity. It seems that you went almost through a shamanistic initiation here. Well, I don't know. I'd always, you see, in, even in my early teens, um, had these problems, uh, problems of suddenly waking up in the middle of the night and having this horrifying vision that life is completely meaningless. And, or, you know, just thinking about something like the depths of space and realizing, you know, it's got to come to an end somewhere, but apparently it doesn't. And then suddenly getting this terrible feeling that, you know, maybe life is a total delusion. Now, to begin with, I think in my teens, G.K. Chesterton once said that in his teens he saw hell, and I really think I did too. Mm. I went through, you know, extreme depressions, glooms. There was one occasion on which I decided actually to commit suicide. <laughs> I'd um, got into this state of, I was working as a lab assistant at the school, <coughs> And um, I got this feeling that what would happen was that I'd make tremendous efforts to push myself up to a level of optimism. I'd do it in the evenings, you know, by reading poetry, thinking, writing in my journals, that I'd go back to the school the next day and bleh, right down to the bottom again. And this was <laughs> the, I, the feeling of the mind parasites. There's something there that waits until you've got lots of energy and then just sucks you dry like a vampire. And this sudden feeling that God was making fun of me made me feel one day, you know, for God's sake, let's not have any more of this nonsense. I'm damned if I'll be played about with like this. Let me kill myself. And immediately I felt this. I felt a curious sense of inner strength. So I went off to night school, quite determined that what I was going to do was to take down the bottle of potassium cyanide from the reagent shelves and drink it. I knew that cyanide burns a hole in the bottom of the stomach. Um, and kills you within seconds. Well, I went into the classroom quite determined. There was a group gathered around the professor at the desk. I went over to the reagent shelves. I took down the bottle of potassium cyanide. I uncorked it, and as I started raising this to my lips, 
I suddenly had an extremely clear vision of myself in a few seconds' time with an agonizing pain in the pit of my stomach. And at the same time, I suddenly turned into two people. You know, I, I don't mean that literally, but I mean that there was I, and there at the side of me was this silly, bloody little idiot called Colin Wilson, who was in a state of self-pity and about to kill himself. And I didn't give a damn whether the fool killed himself or not. But the trouble is, if he killed himself, he'd kill me too. And quite suddenly, you know, a terrific sense of overwhelming happiness came over me. I corked up the bottle, put it on the shelf, and for the next few days was in total control of my emotions and everything else. And I realized suddenly that you can achieve these states of control provided you put yourself in a crisis situation. And that's why throughout The Outsider, I keep saying the outsider's salvation lies in extremes. You focused in your writing somewhat on the works of, of Gurdjieff, who tended to push people into mm. exalted states of consciousness <laughs> by <laughs> using a similar method of pushing them to extremes. Yep, well, you see, the basic point about the philosophy of Gurdjieff and I suppose, you know, about my own basic ideas, is this recognition that we have inside us what I call the robot. It's called a, a sort of robot valet or servant who does things for you. So you learn something like talking French or driving a car or, or skiing or whatever, painfully and consciously, step by step. Then the robot takes it over and does it far more quickly and efficiently than you could do it consciously. <coughs> However, the important thing is not to interfere with the robot once he's learned it, because you completely screw him up if you do. Now, um, the problem is the robot does all these valuable things like talking French and so on for us. The trouble is he also does the things we do not want him to do. We listen to a piece of music, it moves us deeply the first time. Um, we uh, read a poem, we go for a country walk, whatever, and it moves us. But the second or third time you do it, the robot is listening to the music or reading the poetry or doing the country walk for you. I said I've even caught him making love to my wife. And this is a real problem that the robot keeps taking us over and doing the things that we would rather do. Now, Gurdjieff recognized this. Um, he talked about the machine. Um, Gurdjieff, of course, would walk into, let's say, the dormitory of his students at midnight, snap his fingers, and everybody had to be out of bed and in some complex position within two seconds flat. And obviously, you would keep people at a certain level of tension by doing this. Do you remember that Sartre said that during the war, when he was in the resistance, and he was likely to be arrested and shot at any moment, he would never felt so free. And obviously, you wouldn't in these circumstances. You keep your energy so high because of your sense of crisis that you would feel far more free. Now, this is clearly the secret of freedom. Keeping your energy so high that the robot, who is a bit like the thermostat on the wall, which turns on quite automatically when your energies drop below a certain point, and then suddenly, without even noticing it, you're living mechanically, robotically, instead of with a real you. And the interesting thing is that it's only a matter of one degree. Therefore, if it's just one degree to turn onto the robot, it's only one degree of effort to th turn the robot off. Mm -hmm. You know, I had an experience several months ago that threw me into an exalted state, and I, I realize it's one very similar to one that you've had and, and written about. I was riding a bicycle and was hit by a truck, and something like that occurred to you and, and seemed to have the similar effect. Well, I suppose the suicide attempt um, did um, produce this effect. But, you know, ever since then, I recognize that the answer lies in crisis. You see, we feel really alive when we are in what you might call all systems go states. Mm -hmm. If you can actually get yourself into this state where adrenaline is flooding in, when, you know, you're really intensely concentrated on something, then you feel fully alive. Our problem is we're always falling below that level. And what's more, as soon as you place us in a pleasant situation, where we should be extremely happy in theory, immediately everything drops, and quite suddenly, instead of being happy in the pleasant situation, we're happy for a few seconds, and then we're bored. You know, the German philosopher Fichter said, um, it is um, heaven to become free, but actually to be free is nothing. And this is true. As soon as we are free permanently, we just relax. Mm. To become free, that's the moment when it suddenly becomes heavenly. And clearly then, in some peculiar way, we've got to keep our level up. Now, the way I would express it is this. Human beings are what you might call about 49% real you, the essence, the free will, 
and 51% robot. And so the robot slightly always overbalances the real you. Now, as soon as a crisis occurs, as soon as anything drives you to make a real effort, quite suddenly, um, the real you rises that extra 1%, and suddenly you are 50-50. And in the 50-50 moods, you know, setting out on holiday, um, driving along on a spring morning and thinking, my God, isn't it all beautiful? You're in a kind of 50-50 mood. The real you and the robot are perfectly balanced. In crisis situations, in which suddenly, you know, Hans Keller, who used to be head of BBC Music, said that in Germany in the 1930s, when Jews were disappearing into concentration camps and he was Jewish, he said, oh my God, if I can just get out of Germany, I swear that I would never be unhappy again for the rest of my life. And you can see exactly what he meant. It would, he would feel it would be so easy to remain happy for the rest of your life compared to the prospect of vanishing into a concentration camp. But what, what do we actually do? You know, under these circumstances where we think, God, if only, we suddenly find that, you know, normality, pleasantness, puts us into this curious robotic state in which we forget everything and down we go again. You've written extensively about the romantic poets and, and artists who, like Van Gogh, who seem to experience such an exquisite sense of the life force permeating everything and, and such great joy and then would commit suicide and hmm. enter into depths of despair. Well, that was the thing that really started me off on this whole business. I was fascinated by these romantics of the 19th century as you say, like Van Gogh or like, you know, Goethe and Schiller and these words with the early sort of romantic poets who would experience these exquisite moods of sort of universal perception in which everything was self-evidently good and in which everything in the universe seems to be connected together. And then suddenly, you know, um, waking up the next morning thinking, my God, what did I mean by it? the feeling, you know, that it was a, an illusion, that maybe you'd had a drink too many, or whatever. And so the question I asked myself from the beginning is, how could you determine which was true? The moods of intensity, or, you know, the suicide note that Van Gogh left, saying, misery will never end. And the philosophers at the time, when I produced The Outsider, people like A.J. Eyre and Gilbert Ryle and so on, would have said, that's a totally meaningless question. You know, after all, you feel one thing in one mood, you feel another thing in another mood, and they're just relative. Now, I could not believe this, because every time I've experienced these moods of intensity, it's like going to a hilltop and seeing precisely the same vision, exactly the same landscape below you. And you feel it, it must be solid, or it wouldn't be the same every time. It'd be different every time. On the other hand, of course, in what you might call the worm's eye view moods, things appear bad in a different way every time. And you suddenly feel that the truth is these views of the worm's eye view are subjective and emotional, and it's only the bird's eye view views that are true. And I've always believed this deeply. It's the big that's true, not the small. In other words, close upness deprives us of meaning. And I've always felt this is the basic truth of life. Somehow you've got to get that trick of pulling back and seeing things through a kind of wide-angle lens. As soon as you do this, you instantly go into this state of intense optimism. Mm -hmm. In other words, for you, the, the small details of the, the melodramas of our lives that sometimes cause us such despair aren't as real as, as the larger picture. Well, I think that um, the main problem is that we have no way of uh, galvanizing ourselves when we are in the low moods, and that's the real problem. Now, at this point, this was uh, two years after I'd written The Outsider, I came upon this interesting clue in the form of a letter from an American professor of psychology called Abraham Maslow, who wrote to say he'd read a book of mine called The Stature of Man, in which I'd said that I was fed up with the fact that modern literature appears to feel that telling the truth means to express defeat and misery, and that any form of um, conquest um, is generally regarded as a fantastic lie. Maslow said that he got sick of studying sick people because they only talked about their sickness, and he instead decided to study the healthiest people he could find. So he asked among his friends, who's the healthiest person you know? And um, he studied these healthy people. 
And he made this discovery, which no one else had ever made because nobody else ever <laughs> bothered to study healthy people, which was that healthy people have, with a fair degree of frequency, what Maslow called the peak experience, just bubbling experiences of overwhelming happiness. Not mystical, yeah. just ordinary happiness. And the interesting thing was, his students, as soon as they began talking about peak experiences, would say, oh yes, I remember now, and begin to describe some precise peak experience they had had in the past. Not only that, and this was the really significant point, as soon as they began talking about their peak experiences to one another and discussing them all the time, they began having peak experiences all the time. So in some way, you see, the question of how to create the peak experience depends upon realizing that this is a norm of ordinary human consciousness. It's, it's, it's a perception, the peak, it's not an emotion, it's a perception. You turn your face in that direction towards the peak experience, and it's like looking at something that gives you pleasure, like a mother looking at a baby. You just suddenly bubble over. It's as if, if we are willing to acknowledge the possibility of something greater, we, we open ourselves up to it and we can experience that. I think it's more than um, simply this acknowledging the possibility of something greater. I think that we recognize that in our own depths, we possess enormous reserves of strength of which we're normally totally unaware. And this is what fascinates me. This is what, obviously what happened to the Romantics. They just had these bubbling experiences of power coming up from their own depths and were startled by this. And what's more interesting, I think I've noticed again and again, when you experience a sense of power coming from your own depths, you are likely to feel that in some way it's coming from the external universe because it so transforms the universe, like Van Gogh's vision of the starry night, with all, all of the stars turning into great whirlpools of force and the trees looking as, as if they're flames rising towards the sky, it so transforms it that it appears to be an external vision. Of course, all that's happening, so to speak, is that you are glowing with light that transforms the external universe. So in all the mystics, you get this strange thing. They say the inner becomes the outer and the outer becomes the inner. It's characteristic of all the mystical experiences, that. And then as soon as I began to see this, that it is a matter of sort of inner strength, I became extremely interested in this problem. The question I asked myself was, how, then, could you create the peak experience at will? Because obviously, if you want to compare that with what you might call the depth experience, the depression, somehow you've got to create them and put them side by side. So you can see them side by side, and you see which is higher than the other. Well, I talked to Maslow about this, and <clears throat> Maslow said, it's impossible, you can't do it. Um, the peak experience comes when it wants to, and it goes when it wants to, and there's nothing you can do about it. Now, the 19th century romantics had said this, you know, Pushkin compares the poet's heart to a coal, which is blown into a red glow by the flame of inspiration, and then goes black again, and there's nothing he can do about it. And yet, I said to Maslow, in a sense, you're contradicting your own basic theory, that there are higher ceilings of human nature, that we're free. And that's what fascinated me so much, this notion that we're actually free, that we get these curious moments in which freedom floods over us with a kind of explosion that suddenly shakes us awake. It's what the Buddhists call enlightenment. And whenever it hits you, you get this strange feeling of, my God, of course! And then, of course, you wake up the next morning and say, of course what? <laughs> so the problem was to define it precisely. And the only way you could do this is by learning, if possible, to create peak experiences at will. And that was the problem to which I gave myself after about 1958. How could it be done? Mm -hmm. Many Buddhists would suggest there's a logical paradox there because the I, the part of us that wills, is not the part of us that gets to experience that. <laughs> <laughs> yes, precisely. That was something I discovered many years later. Um, you know, in the late um, 1970s, in fact, when, of course, I'd suddenly discovered that we have two eyes inside us. I'd known about this split-brain psychology for years. I mean, I'd known, you know, that the right brain is concerned with pattern recognition and all the rest of it, that the left brain is concerned with logic and language and mathematics, and it hadn't struck me as terribly interesting. I thought, okay, so, so what? Then I read this book, um, the um, Origin of Consciousness in the Breakdown of the Bicameral Mind by Julian Jaynes, in which he explains that if you split somebody's brain down the middle, which they do to prevent epileptic attacks, they literally turn into two people, 
<clears throat> this is what interested me so much, that they become two people and that the person um, who actually says I lives in the left brain. You know, um, what um, Jane says is, if you show a split brain patient an apple with a left eye and an orange with a right eye, and you say, um, what have you just seen? Um, he will reply, an orange. If you say, okay, write with your left hand, which is connected to the right brain, what you've just seen, and you don't let him see it, he will write apple. You say, what have you just written? And he replies, orange. If you show him a dirty picture with his right brain, he will blush. If you say, why are you blushing? He says, I don't know. So, obviously, I, I don't know, means that I lives in the left brain, and that total stranger lives over in the right. Now, you may say, but I'm not a split brain patient. On the other hand, Mozart said that tunes were always walking into his head fully fledged, so he just had to write them down. Now, where did they come from, obviously? That other self in the right brain. And they walked into the place where Mozart lived. Now, if Mozart was a split brain patient, so we all. We all have two hemispheres, of course, to our brain. And what's more, they're totally disconnected. Mm -hmm. Disconnected to such an extent that we're not even aware that we have this other person living in the other hemisphere. Now, when I began writing a book about Wilhelm Reich... We have just about a minute now, Colin. Oh, shit. Um, so, um, I realized that, in fact, these two were exactly the same as Laurel and Hardy in the old movies, and that the person living in the other hemisphere is, in fact, Stan, Stan Laurel. He's the one who sends up all the energy. Ollie is the living you. And somehow they're like lumberjacks at either end of a double-handed saw whose business is to collaborate. If you can once actually get the collaboration of Stan in the other hemisphere, everything is fine. Mm -hmm. So, to summarize a very long story <laughs> here, it would seem as if part of the art of rising from the depths of despair to the heights of peak experience is to develop a kind of uh, working relationship between these Laurel and Hardy characters. Um, one is totally creative, but unfortunately is so silent that you don't even know he's there except in your high moods, your intensive. Van Gogh could see his Stan when he was painting The Starry Night. As soon as you know Stan is really there, what I'm saying is that he will always support you, always send up these surges of creative energy when you need them. Colin Wilson, thank you very much for being with me. It's been a pleasure. And thank you for being with us. Mm -hmm.